Hello, Martha. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Just making sure I can hear you all as well. Mm -hmm. All right, we still have some people coming. Let's see. So um, if people can um, keep your microphones muted at least until you're speaking, that would be great. But for those of you who are here, if you could um, please also turn your video on so that we could at least introduce ourselves at the beginning of the meeting. If you have connectivity issues, then there's a reason why you might need to have your video off at some point. <laughs> totally understand. Um, so we're just gonna give people a few more minutes to enter the room. This meeting is being recorded and the recording has already started. So I just wanna let you know that as you enter the room. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hi, Janet. I feel odd being here without saying hi. Now okay. mute yourself. <laughs> great, we have Jack and I think we're waiting on Dwayne. Oh, great, there. there's Dwayne. There he is making sure that I have everyone. So let's see. Who are we missing? Bob, Janet, Jack, Dan, Martha, Dwayne. Oh, uh, Laura. Let me just make sure Laura is not waiting in the... Athena is there. Yep, I'm going to put Athena. Athena, I'm promoting you to panelists. And, so. and so is Lars there now, too? Oh, good. There we go. Great. OK, great. So I think we'll let everyone just have a minute to get settled in. Uh -huh. um, and again, I just want to announce that this meeting is being recorded and the recording has started. Okay, so I think we have everybody. Um, so uh, as I said um, a moment ago, and for those of you who weren't here quite yet, um, during this meeting, if you can keep your microphone muted unless you're going to speak, um, that would be helpful so we don't have people talking over each other. And um, 
uh, also, if you could keep your video on as much as possible, that would also be great, um, especially during this first meeting. So we're going to start um, with just general introductions and a little bit of an icebreaker. So I will be happy to give you the example. So um, my name is Stephanie Ciccarello. I'm the sustainability coordinator for the town of Amherst and I'm one of the two staff liaisons to this committee. And um, why I'm here is because I'm a staff member, but my fun fact about myself that I would like to share with you all um, is that I sing in a band. So if you have one fun fact you want to share about yourself as well, that would be great. So we're going to do this popcorn style and I will call on someone else. So I'm going to call on Janet. Um, I'm Janet McGowan. I live in Amherst. I'm on the planning board. Um, my fun fact is that I once arrested a ship. And Janet, if you want to choose the um, person to go next. Um, let's see. I choose Jack. Hello. Um, I guess I'm, I'm still on the planning board, but I will be retiring um, as of this month. Um, so I've been on the planning board for six years. I was a chair for, for one year. Uh, and a fun fact is I won my first golf tournament uh, in my life. <laughs> that I recall with a net score, not a gross score, net score, but uh, that just happened a couple of weeks ago. Congratulations. And I'm, on, uh, I'm on the water supply uh, protection committee too. So that's who I'm representing here. And if you could choose someone to go next. Uh, how about Dan? Hey everybody, I'm Dan Corcoran. I'm a researcher at UMass Amherst and a PhD candidate. Um, and I previously worked in environmental consulting. Um, and my fun fact is that I play the guitar. And Dan, if you could choose someone to go next. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Uh, how about Martha? Okay, I'm Martha Hanner. I'm a, a planetary scientist. So I worked at uh, uh, Caltech JPL for a number of years. So, um, working on NASA missions to the planets, uh, Jupiter and so on, and chased comets and uh, so on. So I've been following uh, climate research over the years. And it's been interesting to me to see how uh, the models for other climate atmospheres, which have you know vastly different initial conditions and so on, have really helped to improve the climate models for our own atmosphere. And that leads, of course, to the uh, better predictions for the climate change and so on. Well, let's see, fun fact that I was uh, at the control center when the European space mission went by Comet Halley. And so I was one of the first uh, humans to ever see the nucleus of Comet Halley, 1986. <laughs> okay, and let's see. Um, how about Dwayne? Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, Dwayne Breger here. Um, I'm the uh, director of the Clean Energy Extension at, at, at UMass Amherst, uh, and I serve on the um, Town of Amherst uh, Energy and Climate Action Committee and, and here representing uh, that committee. Um, and uh, really look forward to being part of this um, working group. Uh, fun fact, uh, I guess back in my twenties, I guess I, I ran a marathon in Montreal. Uh, when I crossed the finish line, I swore I'd never run another marathon and I've, I've, uh, I've upheld that promise. <laughs> um, and I will go with Robert. All right. Not a big user of Zoom. I'm Bob Brooks. I live in South Amherst. I'm a retired scientist for the U.S. Forest Service. And fun. I can't think of many fun. I guess my, my, to me, my funnest fact is that I have two adult daughters from India who are both school teachers, which makes me immensely proud. And I guess we'll go to Laura. Yeah. Hi. Good morning, everyone. I'm Laura Pagliarulo. 
Nice to meet you all. Um, I've been in the renewable energy industry for about 17 years. Uh, first started out in energy efficiency, then wind power, and now solar. Um, I run a company that's focused on the real estate under solar. Um, I live here in South Amherst. I grew up in Berkshire County. Um, so a long time Massachusetts resident, come from a family of farmers and teachers. Um, fun fact about me is that I'm a big birder. So uh, I'm gonna choose Athena, please. I didn't think I was gonna be able to participate in this part. So I'm so excited because I have a great one. <laughs> I'm, the, um, I'm the clerk for the town council. I'm pinch heading for our town clerk today. Uh, Stephanie asked me to come and speak about the open meeting law and conflict of interest law with you folks. Um, so I'm not normally gonna be part of your meetings, but I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, and my fun fact is that my very first job was um, dipping hot dogs on a stick. And who hasn't gone yet? Um, Chris and then Paul probably will say Paul on for Chris last. then. Yeah. Hi, I'm Chris Brestrup. I'm the planning director for the town of Amherst. And um, I've been here for about 19 years now. And I worked for the town of Amherst uh, when I was in graduate school. So altogether, I've been working for the planning department for over 20 years. Um, and I guess my fun fact is similar to Robert's. I have two grown um, adopted children from India and um, mine are grown and they still live with us, but um, that's fun because they have animals. They have a dog and a cat and uh, yeah, we really enjoy having them. So Robert and I will have to compare notes sometime. <laughs> Great. And Paul, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn your um, welcome uh, turn it over to you so you can introduce yourself and then give your welcome to the group. Oh, great. Sounds, sounds good. Thank you, everybody. So I'm Paul Bachelman. I am the town manager. Um, so uh, let's see, fun fact. Um, we are, let's see, played in the first, um, went to Hampshire College and played in the first ultimate Frisbee championship game um, against Rutgers back a long time ago. And um, so my role here is just to welcome you and thank you all for dedicating your time to this. Um, it's, this is a time limited committee. You've got a year to come up with a new solar bylaw and uh, regulations that go along with it. It's a giant task. And so I really appreciate you all stepping forward and taking on this important role. <clears throat> this, you know, this, uh, the committee has stamped, come out of some clear lack of regulations that the town has. And so I think we all recognize that pretty quickly that this was important and putting together this working group that's gonna be very directed um, and with under the um, guidance of our planning director and sustainability coordinator um, should be efficient. Um, it's important, so we're gonna to talk today about the open meeting law and the public records laws. Some of you have, many of you have served on committees, so you're probably aware of it. We think it's really important for us to refresh this all the time. Some people haven't served on committees before. We wanna We want to make sure that everybody is aware of what this means, what you're allowed to do, how, how email works, things like that. And so that's why Athena is here. Um, and just um, in terms of the, the um, uh, the, the goal is to come up with legislation that the planning board can review and that ultimately would be adopted by the town council. So that's where our, what our direction is. And there's gonna be a million other topics and things that you're gonna wanna pay attention to, but I ask you to sort of focus on what the end product is because the time is gonna be very limited. And especially when we get through summer and holidays, you're gonna find, wow, we only have X number of meetings to do the work. And so, um, encourage you to um, listen to as many people and as you and, and uh, educate yourself as, as much as you can. So that's all I have to say. And th but again, thank you for your time. Thank you, Paul. So I'm going to turn this over to Athena now. Um, one thing I do want to very quickly say is that um, we do have a web page for this committee. Um, so it's under the town committee's uh, drop down menu. Uh, if you go to the main page under local government committees drop down menu, it's alphabetical. Um, 
and the uh, communications director uh, was away last week. So the packet items are available now for those of you who are in attendee mode. Um, you can actually access that page and the meeting packet items um, from that link. So I will now turn it over to Athena. All right. Um, again, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to talk about this stuff. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the open meeting law. Um, Paul mentioned the public records law, which isn't on the agenda, but I, I do want to touch on that very briefly. And then the conflict of interest law, um, more, more uh, a brief overview, because there is just so much to the conflict of interest law, and a lot of it depends on your specific situation. So I don't want to get too into the details uh, on that. Um, and if you have specific questions about anything after the meeting, you can reach out and I can try and answer those questions and I'll leave some time for questions at the end. So for the public records law, generally records created in your official capacity, including emails are a public record. So it's just good to be aware that when you send emails to each other, when you send emails to members of the public, um, those are all public records and can be requested. Um, there's an official process for submitting our records request and we have a records access officer who's the town clerk. Um, but I just wanna make you aware that your personal emails, if you're using that for town business as in your function in this committee, then those would be a public record. Um, if there are questions about that, no, then I'm gonna move on to the open meeting law. So the purpose of the open meeting law is to make what we do in municipal government public and, and make the public aware of what's going on um, and what the public body you this group is doing and how it's making its decisions. Um, so that should all be a public process. And so the, the open meeting law aims to make all of the actions of the public body a public process. And there's a very small limitation um, on what can be done outside of this public process. And that's usually housekeeping items like um, scheduling a meeting, sharing an agenda, or making you aware that materials are available in the packet. So any kind of discussion is going to happen um, during the public meeting and deliberation is going to happen during the public meeting. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about communications between members of the public body. Um, and when I say public body, I'm talking about this working group. So your communications I think most of your communications are going to come from Stephanie letting you know that a meeting is posted, here's the agenda, here are the materials, um, here's your link to get in and so forth, and communication between all of you, if it is about what's, what you're doing in your official capacity, and if it's among a quorum, then that's prohibited. Um, and that's considered a deliberation of the public body, so that deliberation needs to be held during the open meeting. Um, so uh, I don't need to go too much into the definition of a public body because it's very clear that this group is a public body, but I also want to talk quickly about subcommittees. So if this group gets together and you're having a meeting and you decide that more work needs to be done on a specific item and the group decides that more than one person is going to work on that together, then that is creating a subcommittee. So I just want you to be aware of that subcommittees are also um, required to follow all the open meeting law procedures. So a subcommittee designated by this group would need to post their meetings and take minutes um, and so forth. So like I said, de deliberation is communication between the members of this public body about business within the jurisdiction of the body. And jurisdiction is defined a little bit generally. Um, so anything that could come up between them, it, could come up as a, as a topic for discussion um, at this public body is considered within the jurisdiction. Um, like I said, housekeeping is okay, as long as people aren't commenting back and forth about it. So for example, if somebody were to ask Stephanie to include or ask the chair to include a specific item on the next meeting's agenda, that would be okay as long as it doesn't, you don't also say, um, I'd like this to be on the next agenda because it's really important and et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
the attorney general considers deliberation, considers a communication deliberation, even if no other member responds. So if one of you emails a quorum saying, here are my thoughts, opinions, ideas about a specific topic, then that would be deliberation, even if no other member responds. So it's good to remember that and to keep your thoughts, opinions, ideas, and feelings about a topic for discussion during the public meeting. There are several exceptions to the open meeting law. Um, I think the only one that might apply to this group, I mean, um, just briefly, town meetings and um, meetings of other public bodies, there's different situations you might get into. Um, the only one that, that might apply here is an on-site inspection of a project or a program. So if you ever did an on-site inspection, as long as you're not deliberating at, at the on-site inspection or um, you know doing a, a tour of a facility or something like that, as long as you're not deliberating there, then it wouldn't be considered a public meeting. There are several um, requirements that need to be included in the meeting notice. And normally, um, I think Stephanie would handle that for you. But just so that you're aware, the date, time, location needs to be included in the meeting notice if you're meeting with another public body. So if you're having a joint meeting, then both of the names of the committees would need to be included. All of the topics that the chair anticipates will be discussed. And the topics need to be sufficiently specific so that members of the public have an idea of what the committee is going to be speaking about. Um, it needs to be in an easy, easily understandable format, so we can't be using too much jargon. Um, abbreviations also need to be spelled out that aren't commonly known. Um, and the date and time needs to be included in the, um, the date and time the notice is posted needs to be included. Notices need to be posted at least 48 hours in advance of the meeting. Um, and Saturdays, Sundays, and legal holidays are not included. Um, if there are changes to the meeting notice, then the date and time of the change needs to be included. Um, if there's ever a request for accessibility, anyone needs help with accessing the meeting, then um, that's something that you should bring to Stephanie's attention so that we can make accommodations. For meetings like this, that are everyone is participating remotely, all the votes need to be taken by roll call. The minutes need to include who participated remotely. If anyone disconnects or reconnects during the meeting, then the time of the disconnection and reconnection needs to be noted. And the chair will determine how to handle connectivity issues. So if something happens and um, someone is disconnected and you're about to take a vote or something like that, then the chair can decide to pause the discussion or to pause the meeting while the member reconnects. Um, and usually that's, there's some arrangement beforehand about, you know, contact Stephanie if you're having connectivity issues so we can figure out how to deal with it. The charter requires public participation at all regular meetings. And when we say regular meetings, that means that typically a committee would establish a meeting uh, calendar and meetings listed in, in the meeting calendar are considered regular. If the committee decided to hold um, a retreat or a special meeting that was not included in that meeting calendar, then a special meeting doesn't need to include public comment. Um, but for the most part, all of your regular meetings include a period of public comment. The chair would determine at one point in the meeting to allow public comment. That can be at one point in the meeting or at multiple points in the meeting, depending on how the chair wants to handle that. And the chair can also determine how long a public comment period can be held. Um, so you could say, you know, we're gonna accept public comment and we'd, li we'd like you to keep your comments to three minutes. It's important that if you do ask for a limit on the period of public comment for people that you apply that consistently to everyone. So you couldn't allow someone to talk for five minutes and then cut the next person off at three minutes. Um, this applies more to in-person meetings, which I'll get to in a minute because um, we are in, in a little bit of a, a period where in-person meetings might be held again in the next month or so. But um, members of the public who'd like to record the meeting or take photo or video need to make that known to the chair so the chair can make an announcement that the meeting's being recorded. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but Stephanie announced at the beginning of the meeting that the meeting is now being recorded. 
and there was a little pop-up saying that the meeting's being recorded. So for in-person meet meetings, the chair would announce that the meeting's being recorded and anyone who was physically in the room who wanted to take recordings or take pictures would need to let the chair know so that the chair could make an announcement that there was other recordings and pictures being taken. Um, the, there are several things to be aware of that need to be included in the minutes. So when you're reviewing, creating and reviewing minutes, the date, time, and place of the meeting needs to be recorded. We usually just put virtual meeting if the meeting is fully virtual, and we would include the physical location if the meeting is in a physical location, even if it includes remote participation. The members present and absent, so a list of the members participating and a list of members who were not participating in that meeting needs to be included. Um, the record of all the votes taken, or actions taken, um, a summary of the discussions on each agenda item, uh, a list of all the documents and exhibits used at the meeting, the name of anyone who participated in the meeting remotely. And the summary of the discussion, um, the open meeting law doesn't very clearly define how detailed a summary needs to be. It does not need to be a transcript, but the minutes should provide a person who's reading the minutes with an understanding of what took place. So um, you want to include as much detail as it would take to give someone an understanding of what was discussed and the actions taken at the meeting. Minutes are a public record at the time of their creation. So even before the committee approves the minutes, they're a public record and a member of the public, anyone can ask for a draft copy of the minutes. So if any of you are involved in creating the minutes, it's important to keep your personal notes or opinions in a separate document if you're taking note, your own personal notes at the same time you're taking minutes. Um, and the body must approve minutes in a timely manner. So generally that's within the next three minute meetings or within 30 days whichever is later. Are there any questions about open meeting law before we move on? Paul? <laughs> it's not a question. I just, I just want to emphasize the serial deliberation, which I think is the thing that may trip up committees most frequently. And that means you send an email, one person, you know, person A sends an email to person B, and then that person sends it to, to two other people individually. They haven't contacted a quorum, but that serial communication does constitute a quorum. The best rule is to don't, don't write, and if you're gonna write something, write it to the staff, to Chris and to Stephanie, and then let them distribute it, uh, as opposed to you just contacting each other. Um, and the question I had, um, Stephanie, is, um, uh, uh, and also uh, that the publicness of this body in particular, uh, we have nine people, I believe, in the audience. Um, a lot of people are, are interested in this topic. So I think we want to make sure that we are always above board with all the conversations and the deliberations. So it's always done in the public. That's a high value for the town. Um, and then just a question to you, Athena, is uh, does the committee have to A, vote to accept minutes and B, vote to adjourn or can they be handled in a different way? So our practice, it's it's up to the chair, essentially, to determine how they'd like to adjourn the meeting. Um, our practice at council and council committee meetings has been for the chair to um, announce that the meeting is adjourned, um, but the committee, if it chooses, can take a vote. Um, we just find that that's, it's a little clunky and takes more time. So we usually just declare that the meeting is adjourned. If the chair wants to do that a different way, then we can do that a different way. Um, in terms of approving minutes, um, again, it's up to the public body to determine the method that they approve the meeting minutes. The body can decide if they want to designate one member to approve the meeting minutes on their own, or the meeting minutes can be approved at meetings of the public body. Um, uh, typically, we go over and above the requirements of the open meeting law in terms of materials at meetings and meeting minutes. So for Amherst, our standard is to post meeting materials in advance of the meeting, which isn't required by the open meeting law. We really do our best to make sure that meeting materials are available, not just to members, but to members of the public on our website in advance of the meeting. Again, that's not required. So if 
something were to come up at a meeting and somebody wanted to share something that, that they've worked on independently, or like Paul said, there was um, some document that a member wanted to share through staff members that could be added to the packet during the meeting or after the fact. So a complete list of the meeting materials used doesn't need to be posted at all, but our standard is to post them at, during or after the meeting if they're not available in advance of the meeting. We also post approved meeting minutes for our boards and committees, which is again isn't required by the open meeting law, but it's our standard here in Amherst to make those things publicly available so that um, public records requests are, are eased. People can find that on the committee's webpage and they don't have to go um, making public records requests for meeting minutes. I think I covered it. Paul, did I miss anything? Okay. Chris. Um, actually, so I'm sorry, Martha had her hand up and then oh, put it yeah. down. So Martha, did you have a question? I just didn't want you to lose your opportunity. Yeah, Paul answered my question, so. Okay, great. So go ahead, Chris, and then Janet. Hi, I just wanted to mention um, one other thing, and I don't think Athena touched on this. Maybe she did and I lost it. But anyway, um, not only is it not appropriate for you to talk to each other or email each other about substantive issues but if you're out in the public if you're at the post office or the grocery store or you know the transfer station and someone comes up to you and wants to talk to you about a matter that's going to come before your um, working group you should tell them you know i can't talk to you now but if you come to the next meeting you can express your opinion or if you want to express it in writing you're welcome to submit it to either Stephanie or me, and then we will disseminate it to um, members of the group, but you're not permitted to talk to um, <clears throat> others outside of the meeting, unless you're doing research. But if someone you know, comes up to you and expresses an opinion, you really need to tell them, come to a meeting or send me something in writing. So, Chris, so. Chris do, you, do you mean acting on behalf of the committee with a member of the public? Because uh, committee members, to my knowledge, can hear what members of the public have to say, um, but they couldn't, they couldn't present themselves as acting on behalf of the committee. I think um, in the case of the town council, the situation is a little bit different from the way it is with other boards and committees. And the town council is an elected body, so they're able to hear from their constituents. But... The normal boards and committees like um, the Conservation Commission and the Planning Board and this group really need to avoid um, taking input outside of public meetings from members of the public. And then Janet. So I wanted to um, just say one of the things that the Planning Board does and, you know, which is not an open meeting law violation is that we often share articles and information. Um, and so our usual way of doing that is if someone finds an article or some information of interest, they'll send it to Chris and ask to have it sent out to other board members. You know, I, I hope we do that because there's a ton of information and we have a huge um, range of expertise on this committee. So there's things that you all know that I don't know and hopefully I can add some information too. And I hope that information gets posted. It might be a huge volume, but it'd be great to, um, you know, whatever we're looking at or some particularly good articles had to post on the website. And then I, I didn't plan to say anything, but I would respectfully disagree with Chris about open meeting law um, being a violation to talk to different people in town about their opinions or your opinions about something. It's the open meeting law is talking about communications amongst the decision makers. And so um, if somebody from, you know, comes up to me and says, oh, I really feel strongly about you know, solar and it should be X, Y, and Z, I'm free to say what I think. It's just the communications and the since we're gonna be deciding that, we can't communicate that amongst ourselves outside of open meeting law. So there really, as far as I see, no restraints on our ability to talk to our friends and neighbors about the issues that we're working on. It's just the communications amongst the decision makers. So some clarity on that, I think would be helpful for all of us because I don't think we have that kind of constraint. Um, I think Chris wants to respond to that, but then I'll go to Jack. So Jack, if you could just let Chris respond and then I'll go to you. Chris, go ahead. 
I think that is a restriction and we can um, get a reading on that from uh, Lauren Goldberg from KP Law, but that is um, a restriction that I've been told about ever since I came here, um, you know, almost 20 years ago, and it's been reinforced over and over. So um, I will get clarity on that. Chris, are, you, are you speaking about a, a restriction in the open meeting law or somewhere else? Please I've been ahead. told yeah, by KP Law over and over again that if you're out and about and you're not an elected official, that you really need to avoid talking to people about topics that are coming before your body, um, substantive topics that are going to be deliberated before your body. So I don't know if it's written in the open meeting law, but that's that's what I've been told again and again by town attorneys. So that's what we'll we'll follow up with uh, legal counsel to find out the answer to this rather than going back and forth okay. um, and get a definitive opinion on that. And then Jack, you're next. Uh, yeah, so it sounds like we can take in information, but we can't really give, give it out. <laughs> Uh, or lend opinions, that sort of thing. But uh, also with uh, hitting on what Janet was saying in terms of the information, I know the Water Supply Protection Committee, we have uh, an online uh, directory that you know, I personally dumped like 40 documents uh, there for the committee, uh, committee to uh, review if they so uh, choose. And uh, for something like this, I'm wondering, you know, that could be an option uh, uh, for this working group. Um, because I know we're going to have tons of information coming through uh, across our uh, our Zoom here uh, that uh, Chris and Stephanie will distribute. So one th one question I had was, and I, I didn't know if I missed this, is uh, how are the minutes going to be taken? Is that going to be the town's responsibility? Um, we'll we'll get to that when we get to the. Um election of chair and meeting scheduling, we'll, we'll talk about minutes. I'm taking them today just okay. to make it easier, but we'll, we'll talk about that and it, that'll be further on in the agenda. Yeah, because that's a big, that's a big lift. Yeah, yep. we'll talk about that. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it's, a great, it's a great oh, point. I'm sorry, it's a great point, Janet and Jack, that um, you can distribute, you know, articles that might be pertinent to, to the conversation. Um, it's just important that when you distribute those, you don't include your opinions about them when you share them, if you're, if you're not sharing them through staff. And I, I think that um, Janet, what you mentioned, sending them to staff to share in the packet is is great because then your your opinions aren't aren't tacked onto them. So yeah, I will say that typically my request would be that you all send them to me and or Chris, or actually, if you're going to send them to one of us, send them to both of us. Um, but I will be the one who will be maintaining the website and the resources. So um, anything that you plan to share with the group should come through us so that we can also then make sure that gets into the packet and onto the website. Dwayne? Yeah, I just <clears throat> wanted to clarify um, uh, that in terms of um, sharing information about the conversations of this working group with the public, um, we, we're also here, uh, some of us at least are representing other committees that we're on somewhat with the purpose of relating the uh, deliberations of the working group to our committees. Uh, so I just wanted a clarification that we are able to uh, discuss, uh, maybe with some commentary, I'm not sure, um, the deliberations and, and progress and, and discussions of this working group with our town committees. So Athena, my understanding, and I'll ask you to clarify, um, because we have, and this was something I was gonna review when we reviewed the charge, but uh, we do have four committee members who are representing other bodies. So the reason they were chosen to, to uh, represent those committees was to be able to bring information back, share that and get the collective knowledge of that committee and with the understanding that that would happen during open session. So when they're in a meeting, that is when you would have that discussion with the committee and anything that you would get from in a response that you could bring back to then this deliberation would be used and would be actually helpful. Um, we don't expect you to go back and then speak with your committee members separately, independently, outside of public session. So that, and, and so Athena, you can correct me or tell me if that's um, accurate. 
yeah, I think having those conversations with your committee during an open meeting law during during open an open meeting would be appropriate. Um, if the chair of the committee that you're representing here anticipates that there will be some discussion about your report back to the committee, then it would be helpful to list in your um, in your committee agenda that um, you know a report from member on the solar bylaw working group progress or something so that more of a discussion can be had. So um, our practice is to include a committee report period during council meetings so that the, the representative or the chair from various committees can report on what the committee's been doing. So uh, Janet, if you wanted to go back to the planning board and talk about what the solar bylaw working group is discussing, then the planning board would want to include an item on their agenda saying report from Janet McGowan on solar bylaw working group so that they could discuss that, have a conversation. Athena, I have an, a, a question, um, a scenario, if you will. If you have a committee member who is represented on this committee um, and is liaison to another from another board um, or committee, if they want to get feedback from a member of their other committee, so not this one, but their other committee, are they allowed to do that? Does that violate, violate open meeting law? From one member? From so there's so they weren't they weren't identified as a subcommittee so I'll I'll just use ECAC just because it's an easy example for me um, so if Dwayne leaves this deliberation this meeting goes back and there's something that he wants to review with another member of the ECAC um, and they're not an official subcommittee are they allowed to do that because my understanding is that they are but I would love clarification on that. So two members of the ECAC because ECAC is nine, right? Correct. So two members wouldn't constitute a quorum. So Dwayne could go and speak to one ECAC member about something that's coming up for this committee. If that member then goes to talk to another member and another member and another member or emails are going back and forth and you can get into what Paul mentioned called serial deliberation and that would be a violation. So. Um, it's a good idea to pick your person, just have one person that you look to for feedback or to bounce ideas off, as long as that other person isn't, doesn't constitute a quorum of a, your committee or a subcommittee. So if you're on a subcommittee with three people and two people is a quorum, does that make sense? It's, I think it's just sometimes gets confusing and the clarification here is that, the, the committee itself did not designate them as a subcommittee. That's the, the clarification. And I think the piece that sometimes get, con, gets confusing for people. So Duane was specifically identified as representing the ECAC in this committee, um, but another member who isn't can still be uh, looked to for guidance. But as long as the ECAC did not identify that other member as working on this specific issue as well as a subcommittee or as a subcommittee on it on a different topic right okay yep all right are there any other questions about open meeting law so like i said i'm going to I'm going to just briefly go over the conflict of interest. Um, conflict of interest law, it, it can it can get very nuanced, and it really depends on your individual situation and um, what connections you have to businesses and what family members' connections have to um, businesses and and other dealings. So. If you have questions about conflict of interest, if you feel like you might need to file a disclosure or you're unsure, it's really helpful to contact the ethics division at the state. And if Stephanie hasn't already shared that contact info or the website, then um, I can pass that along so she can share it with all of you. They're really helpful on the phone um, and it's helpful to share all the information that's pertinent to the situation with them so that they can give you good advice. And that's their job at the ethics division is to give you good advice before something happens. Um, 
where you, you know you can't go backwards and and undo a vote because you should have recused yourself or or whatever. Um, so the ethics division is a great resource if you if you need advice about your specific situation. Um, but in general, um, you are all considered municipal employees. You've been designated as special municipal employees, and I'll get into that those differences a little, in a, a minute. But there are various restrictions on what you can and can't do. So you can't ask for and accept bribes. Um, people can't give you gifts because of your official position or because you've taken a specific action. You can't accept gifts for more than $50. And that includes gifts that total $50, multiple gifts that total over $50. Um, you can't use your position as a member of this committee or another committee to get something you wouldn't or otherwise be entitled to for yourself or someone else, a family member. Um, you can't act in your official capacity when you or your immediate family, business, or future employer has a financial interest. Um, false claims apply more to um, staff, but that would be, you know, like falsifying timesheets to indicate that you were working when you weren't. Um, there's also restrictions on appearance of conflict. So if a reasonable person would think that you could be improperly influenced by your connections, uh, then it's important to file a disclosure of that appearance of a conflict of interest. Um, those disclosure forms are available in the town clerk's office and they need to be filed with the town clerk in a timely manner. There's, um, we recently had a discussion at, at a council meeting about how often and how, the degree of specificity about filing a disclosure of a conflict of interest. And the advice that I understood at that point was that it really depends on the specific situation. So you couldn't file a blanket disclo disclosure for an appearance of a conflict of interest. You really need to think about what the body is doing at this point in time. And if there is an appearance and then file that disclosure and make that disclosure known during the public meeting. You couldn't disclose confidential information being discussed at the meeting. Um, that really rarely happens if you're not um, entering into executive session, which I don't think would be an issue for this committee. Um, there are restrictions after you leave your municipal position. Um, there's a one-year cooling off period and restrictions on partners. Um, some of those things are modified for you folks as special municipal employees. So um, I can touch briefly on some of the changes for special municipal employees, but I encourage you to go and read the info sheet and I can send that on to Stephanie so that she can distribute it to you about the changes to the conflict of interest law for special municipal employees because you are allowed to do things that other board and committee members aren't who aren't designated as special municipal employees. Um, so you could represent private parties before municipal boards other than this board provided you haven't officially participated in the matter and it's not before this board. You could act as an agent for private parties in connection with the matter of interest to Amherst, provided you haven't participated in the matter as a municipal official, um, and it's not within your official responsibility. Um, you can receive pay in connection with matters involving your city or town. So a lot of these get into the sort of very specific situations that people get into when they have a business connection and also are acting in an official capacity in this body. So I'm not sure how helpful it is to get into all of these very nuanced situations. So maybe it's better to just ask if there are questions about this and I can try and answer questions. Chris? I believe that when people are um, appointed and they go to the town clerk to um, you know, swear themselves in, that the town clerk then gives them a link or information about um, being trained in conflict of interest law. So um, I think that they, and then they have to go through this every, every two years or something. And every year they have to swear that they did something. I don't remember exactly what they have to do, but all I'm saying is that I think that each member of this group gets an opportunity to go through that process and that training. Um, so I don't think we need to go um, into a lot of detail about it here. Okay, yes, that's correct. You should have received a receipt of the open meeting law guide, and that needs to be kept by the town clerk's office. You should have also received a receipt to fill out for the conflict of interest law. There's also an online trading that, like Chris said, needs to be completed every two years. So if you haven't already done that, then it's important to do that. 
I don't believe the conflict of interest law training covers special municipal employees in very much detail. So again, I think it's helpful to go and read about special municipal employees and contact the ethics division if you have questions about your specific situation. Are there any other questions? Okay, and if anyone has any questions that you think of later, um, please feel free to uh, send them to me and I'll get responses from Athita and share them with the group because it's likely that if you had a question, somebody else might have had a similar question. So I can definitely get responses. Okay, All right. thank you so much, Athena. Really, Thanks really appreciate your pinch hitting at the very last minute. Thanks. <laughs> All right, so we will move on. Our next agenda item is to review the charge. So I'm going to share my screen and we will just go over this fairly quickly because we have other items to discuss. Um, so just give me a moment. Okay, so um, this is our official charge um, that was um, voted on by the town council. And um, as you know, you are a seven member body. I did wanna point this out because in the charge, it identifies the Board of Health as having a representative, but the Board of Health was unable to um, find someone from that committee who was willing and able to serve at this time. So instead of having a representative from the Board of Health, we have an additional um, resident member who is not a committee member. And as it has been pointed out to me that all of you are residents of the town of Amherst, and that is true, but the um, specific difference here is that the resident members don't currently serve on other committees and are not representing other committees. committees. So they are basically representing their um, interests in this issue, in this topic. So as you know, the goal is to draft a solar zoning bylaw um, that includes standards and guidelines that will help us for looking at the development of solar within the community and specifically to large ground mount solar. Um, we sort of have rooftops somewhat covered, but we really don't have um, large ground mount solar installations um, specifically identified. So that is going to be what your charge is. And as Paul noted, it will be very easy for us at some points to <laughs> run off the rails, if you will, um, because, you know, we may find that like anything else, you know, these things will lead to conversations that can lead to other interests and other concerns. And so we have to always come back to why we're focused on creating this um, solar zoning bylaw. So we have a year um, to work on this and um, Chris will talk a little bit more about engaging a consultant. Um, we'll be looking at resources. Uh, some of the resources Chris and I will provide as already noted by Janet and Jack and I'm sure Laura, I'm sure all of you um, will have some materials and resources that you'd like to share with the group. So again, when we have those resources, just make sure that they come through Chris and I, and we will share them with the group and we will make sure that they get into the meeting packets. Um, so those will be available on the town website. We will always do our best to get them ahead of the meeting. We can't absolutely 100% guarantee they will because sometimes we literally get things um, during the meeting or just before the meeting um, or sometimes after the meeting because they're referenced in the meeting, but then we get them afterwards. So we will do our best to get the materials together in a timely fashion as we can. So our goal is to be done on or before May 31st. Um, I'm assuming giving timing, we're going to be certainly shooting for on May 31st at the very least. So um, I think you know, we, we do have a, a set time frame to work within. So it'll be important that we um, work as efficiently as we can within the time that we have. So are there any questions on the charge? I'm not totally able to see you. So if you are all okay, I'm gonna actually close it out, but you do have it in your packets and there is access on the town's website on your solar bylaw working group page. So. Um, 
Are there any questions on the charge? Now I can see you all. Jack. Yeah, so uh, wondering if uh, we're including energy, uh, battery storage, energy uh, storage systems, uh, but would this bylaw cover uh, independent uh, battery storage facilities that are not, uh, you know, ancillary to a uh, solar ground mount? So that might, was probably a discussion that we're going to have in developing this bylaw. I think because it is related, but not directly because they would be sort of standalone. So um, I think that's something that we'll have to determine as we discuss this. Battery storage is referenced, but what you're citing is something not that's something not directly related to the solar installation. So we'll have to determine that as we have this discussion. It probably, in my mind, I, you know, my first reaction is to say probably not because it should be specifically addressed with solar. This is a solar development bylaw. So battery storage paired with solar makes sense to discuss. Uh, battery storage on, on its own, I would defer to Chris on something like that. That would be probably a separate issue. Other questions? Okay. All right, then moving along to our next fun topic, meeting scheduling. <laughs> This is always fun. We have to find a day and a time that works <laughs> for us to meet. So um, I know that um, I, I was sort of surprised that, you know, um, an earlier morning uh, time frame actually worked for everybody for this meeting. So that's great. But I think um, there's two ways we can handle this now. We can sort of have a discussion about um, about when is the best time for folks to meet, or I can send out a doodle poll, gather all those responses, and then at the next meeting, um, we'll have to schedule the next meeting, but then I can sort of give the um, options that were the most, had the most hits. Um, Laura, you have a question. Yeah, Stephanie, are you looking to establish like, you know, like the conservation committee has like one certain day of the month, like the second Tuesday or something like that? Um, and the reason why I ask is because I certainly for myself and I expect for others that summer is busy mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if it might be sort of customized at least until we get through these busy months. So I think we, we want to make sure that I, I would think at the very least during the meeting we would have to come up with our next time frame for our next meeting so that it's announced publicly and that we can post it publicly so the next meeting would be issued as a date and time certain. So we'd have to do that at every meeting. If we establish a date and time, we're required to have a quorum. Um, I think, you know, it, it sort of gives uh, more reliability of frequency and understanding of when we're gonna meet. It makes it easier for people to plan around. I mean, it is summer, you're correct. I don't anticipate that everybody is going to be able to make every single meeting but that's why we need to have a quorum. So a quorum can make a decision. You don't have to be here at every meeting, um, although we should do our best because this is such a, a tight time frame in which you're convening. You're only together for you know less than a year, really. So um, and that's why I think what we need to determine is the frequency of our meetings. Do we want to meet? Um, I think once a month won't be enough. It, there may be a time in which we if right now we may say that we meet more frequently in the beginning, um, and then there will maybe a period of time if we're working with consultants where the consultant might be doing some work that we might meet less frequently, but those are certainly, if we have a set schedule, we can certainly post and announce that that meeting won't happen or we'll postpone that meeting. So those are sort of the various scenarios. I would recommend because of the time frame. I would really recommend at least, um, if not every other week, then at least uh, twice, twice a month to have like a date, like the second and fourth, or first or third day of the week per month. That would that's what I would recommend. And just know that when you do that, sometimes the second and third or the second and fourth are not every other week. There may be gaps of time in between those dates. So. Um, so I guess I would first see what, you know, if people have some thoughts on what might be possible. 
and then I can we can always do the doodle poll after, but just some initial conversation. Um, Bob. Well, actually, I was just going to suggest we just go to the doodle poll. I found those things pretty useful. We're just going to get really lost here with seven people trying to come up with something right now. Um, yeah, just some general, I'm thinking, looking for maybe just some general, like it's good to even know if people, if mornings, afternoons, or evenings are better for people, like just getting that much of a, an understanding would be helpful. Um, Chris? Um, so you were able to get everyone together this morning, which is a Wednesday morning. So I guess I would ask the question, is Wednesday morning a good time for people to meet? Okay, I'll ask that, but when we, let me get to other questions and then we'll get back to that question, Chris. Jack? Yeah, I just, um, um, I, I think the, the summer is really busy. I'm just wondering if you kind of like have a, a soft opening for July, August, <laughs> maybe meet, you know, once a month uh, and then get into the, you know, bi-weekly, uh, you know, in September. Uh, that's just a suggestion. And uh, I, I was able to make this uh, mean, but I'm sort of like Laura, um, I would think we'd, we'd be uh, uh, less restricted for like a, a late afternoon, like a five o'clock or, or evening meeting. Uh, but I mean, I'm, we'll, we'll see what other people think. Um, okay. And Dwayne? Yep, I was just going to add um, that I, I I understand what um, Jack just put forward with regard to maybe a soft start in the summer, but I was going to suggest um, every other week or twi twice a month or roughly twice a month uh, to get us going well here. Um, I was also, uh, if, for those of us with adult children, uh, early, uh, late, late, late afternoon, early evening makes uh, is really much better. Um, uh, that being said, uh, for those with children, that may not be the case. I'm very uh, open open to uh, that discussion. Um, I will say just for myself, um, I was able to make room in my schedule for this meeting Wednesday morning, but generally that's the that's the worst day of, of morning of the of the week for me uh, with some other standing meetings that um, are out of my control. Um, uh, so that's just what I had to add. Okay, thanks, Janet. Um, one of one concern I have is, um, you know, being available, like uh, having a time that um, members of the public can attend. And um, I don't know if that means varying it to evening meetings and morning meetings, maybe around five, you know, so people are 530 or something like that. But I also totally empathize with anyone with young children, like five to seven would be like the witching hour. Um, so. Okay, I will note that we have 10 attendees here. Um, members of the public. Um, okay, so any other comments? So I, Chris, I think in response to your question about are Wednesdays at this time good, Dwayne's response is no. So, and that's a pretty solid no. So I think what I will do is having taken some of this information from you all about um, evenings every other or twice a month, I'll just put together a doodle poll and send that out. And then at the next meeting, we'll have to decide uh, what works best for everyone. Chris? So I just wanted to note that um, we should avoid meeting on nights when the town council meets or when the planning board meets or when the conservation commission meets. Well, any of these bodies i mean we have four committees represented yeah. here so we'll have to schedule them you know obviously we're not going to conflict with your current meeting so actually what i would request is if you could all let me know the dates that your committees typically meet for those of you that are on other committees please send that to me um, and i'll take that into consideration when putting together the doodle poll um, i know i can find it online but it's just easier if you just send it to me so i don't have to go digging thank you Okay, so um, meeting scheduling will be a topic for the next agenda as well. And moving on. So um, the next item on our agenda is engaging consultants. And there are two consultants that will be engaged for this process. Um, 
one for a solar assessment and one for the solar bylaw. I will speak to the solar assessment and Chris will speak to the solar bylaw. Um, the solar assessment is not something that you all are going to be specifically um, overseeing, but it will impact the work that you're doing. Uh, there is an RFP that's being developed and Duane as a member of the ECAC um, is working closely with me on developing that assessment. This is for solar siting, community-wide solar siting. Um, Duane has very specific expertise in that arena. And so um, he's working with us as a rep representative of the ECAC um, and also because of his background on helping us develop that RFP. So that is in the works. Um, we are hoping to my my hope, if at all possible, is that that will be going out um, soon. We're deciding whether we're going to go through the state process, which is actually a faster process than actually putting out an RFP. So I'm calling it an RFP, but one is one is I think an RFQ. Paul, correct me or not if that's correct for going through the state process. It's an RFQ, and we the state has a list of consultants that are already pre-approved and vetted that we can use that's a faster process, but it does limit us. If we go with an RFP, we can put it out to anyone beyond that list, but it does take longer. Um, we have a little more control in our request, but then um, you know, the process, as I said, just takes a bit longer. So it's likely that we're going through the state process just because it's faster and they have already approved um, consultants. And, you know, we haven't gone through the list. We didn't see any reason to believe that we wouldn't have uh, capable and competent consultants to choose from. So just that's an update that that's happening. The result of that will be a map layer that will identify um, different zones, if you will. And we don't know exactly what that will look like. So I'm sort of giving you an overview of what we're looking for. I can't say exactly how that will flush out um, during that process, but there will be a, a GIS map layer that will be available to sort of pair with the solar zoning bylaw. And our time frame is hopefully to have this um, completed within six months of engaging the consultant. So um, that will be, um, a process that will include, we will certainly include you as they develop the mapping. We will certainly, you know, bring it to you for your input. Um, we will also be engaging the community where we're asking for at least two community wide forums um, for people to weigh in on priorities and prioritization of solar siting within the community. Um, also, we're asking the consultant to reach out to staff so that when they come up with this map layer, it will be something that fully integrates um, the, you know, the priorities and concerns of the entire community as a whole. So um, it's it's a big task, but it will um, it will be moving along soon and it will be um, it will be presented to you so that you can use that information as you're developing the solar bylaw. Janet, you have a question. So is, is the assessment just going to be like, here are places that we could put solar and this is how much solar we can get from it and some sort of economic analysis or costs, or is it actually saying, here's where the community doesn't want solar, here's where we want it. Cause I, I thought that would be the work our, of our committee working with the community based so, on, based on the, um, the charge and the description. So the assessment will be um, for identifying locations suitable for solar. And some of that will be based on community priorities. Um, the economic piece will not be part of that, but that's a whole other layer of, um, of analysis and assessment that we, quite frankly, we don't have the budget for. You know, a, a community-wide analysis of just siting itself is going to be pretty intensive and also um, creating the GIS mapping layer. So what we have, there was, I, I will just tell you that there was a solar study just recently completed and it, it was only recently just done and only shared with um, Paul Bockelman recently um, that looked at 10 locations within town. And we can share that with you, although, that's very specific to specific development in locations. And it sort of gets us to a next level of prioritization for, for municipally owned locations. So it's not like, it's not looking at townwide. This is townwide. This is like, 
where are there areas where solar makes sense? Where are there areas solar doesn't make sense? So oh, I'm sorry, Stephanie. So who makes that decision about what the community's priorities are and what's what land or areas are acceptable, not who's the decision maker? Is it the consultant? Is it somebody from the town staff? Is it you? Is it not is it us? It's not me. That the the assessment will be ultimately the the town will take all of the input from the forums, from staff, um, from committees, and we'll look and um, the deciding factor will be the town. It'll it'll be the town manager. And I'm not sure, Paul, you'll have to correct me on this because I'm not clear procedure wise if that's like a town council finalize or if that's you that will finalize the final map. Um, prioritizations. So, I mean, I think if we're talking about, I mean, I think this is going to be, a, I think you're right, it's going to be a public discussion. The, the town council is clearly going to have a role in this. Um, and I, I would think the planning board in terms of the zoning would, would have a key function as that as well. Um, yeah, I don't think there's like one sort of like, okay, it's going to go here type thing unless it's public land. But Chris has her hand up as well. Chris. Oh, I was going to say that if this is a zoning layer, um, similar to what we're developing for the flood mapping, then it would be going through the planning board and the CRC and town council would need to vote on it as a zoning layer. So it depends on how we categorize this, but my assumption is that it will be a zoning layer. Uh, Martha? Uh, yeah, I, a question of, about the study. I mean, who is defining the charge to the study? I mean, is that something our committee is going to be involved in at all? I would had the original impression that we would be. So what um, the just engaging a consultant to do the study right now is a fairly broad topic of you are going to do a study. When it comes to the prioritization, that will that's when the once the consultant is chosen, the more specific details will then be ironed out with the consultant, and that will where that will be where we will get other people's input on the prioritizations of you know where solar can be sited within the community. So the general RFP is is you know to do an assessment and create a map layer. Um, the details of it will get ironed out with the town and the committees as we as we work on that does that make sense <laughs> no oh well tell me so what it, what is it that you're hoping yeah i i guess the the role of our committee or also the question for the for this uh study that the consultants are doing is it uh studying where solar can go on any scale i.e you know on developed uh land or parking lots or right. So uh, that's as well as the larger scale on open lands or right. what's so the range. The, so the solar assessment will be something, a tool that you can help use um, in its completed form, and you will have an opportunity to weigh in, but this committee is not overseeing development of the assessment. That's something that's happening at the staff level. And that, but but is going to include input and outreach from other committees. Your group, your specific function for this group is to develop the bylaw, the zoning bylaw. So that assessment will be a tool you can use, but you're not specifically developing the assessment. You'll use it as a tool, but you will have an opportunity to weigh in on what that ass assessment will include, just like everybody else. So the ECAC wants to weigh in, everybody wants to weigh in on what that will prioritize. So that's why there's gonna be uh, you know, community engagement around, around that but you're not overseeing the consultant. The consultant, and Chris will get to this in a minute. And again, these are gonna be two separate consultants that we're working with. Staff will be working on the assessment, but you all will probably be working more closely with the solar bylaw and Chris can speak to that in a moment. So I'm gonna to go to Laura. Yeah, thanks. Um, so in my, first of all, I think it's great you guys are developing um, a GIS mapping tool. Um, Many years ago, when I was working in Virginia, we developed a similar GIS-based tool that essentially incorporated things like, you know, historical sites, wetlands, you know, this is for wind, so and, and solar, but sensitive bird habitats, bat habitats, which is a good reference point, but separate from the bylaw to say anyone can use this tool just to get a sense of, you know, 
is this a good place to develop solar or not? You know, does this have sensitive species? Does this have endangered species? Um, so I think it's great uh, that we're doing it. Um, and, uh, you know, to the extent possible, I would just say, if there's, you know, things we can add, you know, um, to develop a tool, that'd be great, so. Great, thank you, Laura. Dwayne? Yeah, I was just gonna add my sort of um, uh, perspective and, and, and sense of the, uh, of, of this assessment. Uh, which to some extent I think is is really a tool, uh, as Stephanie I think articulated after I put up my hand, but uh, that it's really a, a tool for the town, uh, the town constituents, as well as our committee, our working group, uh, to make use of as we deliberate on 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 potential zoning uh, by laws. Um, uh, that it it is to some extent. Um, value less uh, in terms of, of uh, identifying um, using GIS uh, over a number of different criteria of, of, of layers, uh, what what the town looks like with regard to solar uh, potential solar siting under different criteria uh, that this group uh, or others might want to uh, be able to put into this GIS uh, mapping software to get a sense of not specific <clears throat> locations uh, necessarily, uh, but um, but more so uh, the extent to which or the capacity available to the to the town uh, with regard to solar development, both in the on the built environment as well as on the unbuilt environment, um, in order to help uh, the town to um, and our committee working group. Uh, to come up with uh, to use as a tool to come up with with bylaws that make make sense. Janet, um, I th I think it's important to have clarity about who's deciding what, um, and I, I'm not sure I'm clear on that. Um, I thought that this this committee would be um, making recommendations about where solar is appropriate, large scale solar is appropriate or not, and making those recommendations to town council based on the language and my understanding. I do think that a lot of members of the public are super interested in where it's gonna go. I mean, I mean that's obvious from what happened you know, a while ago. And so I would love to see some clarity, hopefully in writing about when who's deciding what, like when you say staff, you know, is that you, is that, you know, Christine, is that the planning department? Like, who's deciding this? Is it the town manager? Um, you know, if the town council, when you say the word town, you know, we all know that it's just a very diffuse. It could be the town council, it could be the boards, it could be different departments. And so I think clarity on this question is going to be really useful to the public. It's going to be really useful to me and I think the committee about what we're deciding. If we're just going to collect, get the information from the assessment, and then write up a bylaw that looks like a, you know, to me as an attorney, that's like kind of cut and dried um, issue, you know, you know, other, other than the blizzard of options we have in different bylaws. But I do think we need a lot of clarity about what decisions need to be made and who's making them. And I would love to have that at the outset and clear so we don't have conflicts later or confusion later. Thank you, Janet. Um, well, so I think, um, you know, oh, Chris, go ahead. Um, I've been thinking about it while we've been talking and thinking that maybe it makes sense that there are two separate maps, that there's a map that can be used as a tool, as Duane was describing, and there's a map that's part of the zoning bylaw that says where the town wants solar to be located. So that may be something that we consider, you know, as we're moving forward, that there's not one map, but there's one that provides information and another one that says what the town's um, desires are and intent is as far as uh, where solar can, can or can't be located. Um, okay, well, I was just gonna ask Paul if he had any thoughts. <laughs> Um, seeing that we have you here, uh, but I think we've lost him. So, um, all right, I think, you know, um, I thank you all for your input. Um, I think, you know, as far as, you know, right now we didn't, 
plan on having two maps, but that might be the way we go. I think at the very least, the assessment that's going to happen now, um, it's being it's being led by staff. And when I say staff, I mean me and I work for the town manager and the town, which it is the town. And we did include, you know, we are including public engagement as part of that process. We're including outreach to staff, but I think I'm, I'm trying to think of this somewhat like the, um, somewhat like the um, development of the climate action plan and that we, you know, we had public engagement, we went to staff, we went to various committees, we, you know, we sort of put the, the pri put things out there to sort of prioritize and then sort of took that information back and worked with what were the things that rose to the top. And that is how I would assume we will be working with this process as well. When things, you know, automatically come to the top, we will be identifying those things and then we will call them, glad you're back, We'll be bringing that, you know, we'll be sort of summarizing that and bringing that to um, the town manager. And as Paul said, he's going to, you know, obviously the CRC is going to want to engage in this as well. So, um, Paul, I just don't know. I, it sounds like they want a clear process, but I'm not sure um, beyond the assessment and gathering that information what the yeah. next steps would be. I think I think it's a good question. Um, I think looking back to the charge, we can look at what the charge says and then provide better clarity. And maybe that could be a topic for the, you know, for the next meeting. Yeah, I think maybe the confusion is how the assessment is being used for this committee, because in my mind, the assessment was a little bit separate from the work of this committee, mm -hmm. other than it will be the completed project would be like we would, we would talk to you as it was being developed, we would get community input, but the, but the, the assessment is kind of a tool you would use, but not necessarily something um, that you would specifically be creating as a result of this process. It yeah, was I mean, something that would help you. I mean, again, the end product is supposed to be a solar bylaw and that's that's where we need to focus the energy. Right. But so they are. They, but these things that are related, I, we get that. Yeah, they're interrelated, but they are separate. So um, so sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on then to Chris so she can talk about the process of engaging a consultant for the solar bylaw. So um, we as staff have done a lot of research um, already about, you know, what various cities and towns around the state have um, put in their solar bylaws. Um, some of them are more up to date than others, um, but we feel like we need help from a consultant who has written solar bylaws for other municipalities. And we have um, around twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars to hire someone or a company to do this with us, and um, you know, while we feel like we know kind of the structure of what we may want to put in a solar bylaw, there are aspects of it that we are unfamiliar with, such as battery storage, and that's one that's really um, you know coming into the public eye and being talked about. Um, more and more lately. So um, that's one area that we know of that we need um, outside expertise. And there may be other areas as well that we don't even know. We don't know what we don't know. So as we get into this more, um, you know, we, we will be needing advice. So, so we're going to put together a scope of work for a consultant. And um, as Stephanie was talking about, there are different ways of hiring a consultant. One way is actually to um, hire somebody through Plan uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. And they have been um, helping cities and towns, particularly in the Western part of the state to develop solar bylaws. So um, that may be a good route for us to go because then we wouldn't have to go through the RFP process. Um, but then again, we may choose to hire somebody from the state list as Stephanie was talking about. Um, I'm not sure that we want to go with an RFP. That does seem like a lengthy process, and um, that may be more than what we need at this point. So, um, so we'll be putting together a scope of work, and we can bring the scope of work to you to show it to you, just like we've been doing with the planning board. We showed the planning board recently a scope of work that we had for a design consultant, and we can get your input on that. Um, ultimately, it will be the town manager's decision about exactly what kind of help we'll ask for. Um, so, you know, we're hoping to do that sometime very soon. We just got the budget approved, so we know we have the money now. And, and so we'll be putting together that scope of work very quickly, and we're hoping to hire somebody sometime this summer. 
Um, and so that's really what I have to say. And I think that you will be, um, you know, brought along, made aware of what the consultant is doing, and then, you know, probably meeting with the consultant at some point to talk about various issues, but we don't know exactly what those details will be yet. Jack, do you have a question? Yes, uh, I just want to say that I did broach that subject <clears throat> you know, a month or so ago with the Piner Valley Planning Commission, because I don't think they had really looked at that. So, if, you know, if you, you are approaching them as well, Chris, maybe uh, that can, you know, enable that to, to make that happen. So it's, that's great. Um, Martha? Uh, yeah, just wanted to say, I mean, it sounds like making use of the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission sounds like a good idea because they are, you know, knowledgeable and thinking in terms of the needs of, of Western Massachusetts here and uh, issues and, you know, and on other subjects, I've, I've been impressed with their work. Um, and I also then had a question of whether the uh, solar bylaws from other communities are available for us to have a look at. Chris, you want to respond to that? Yeah, we could probably post links to those. Um, yeah, I'd be interested mm -hmm. in, 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 in reading them and seeing. So yeah. just a comment um, is that some of them are very restrictive and some of them aren't restrictive at all. So there's the full range yeah. of um, bylaws out there. And it seems to depend on you know, the situation of the city or town, if it has already been hit with a lot of um, solar installations and is really kind of, um, what should I say, disturbed by that. They tend to put on very strong um, solar bylaws and other cities and towns that um, are more welcoming will put, uh, will have things that are less, uh, less restrictive and more flexible. So there's, you'll see a full range of these things. So yes, we can post a list. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Chris? Okay, great. Thank you. So that moves us on to the next agenda item, which is just a quick review of packet materials. Um, I'm just going to reference the um, the materials that we gave you regarding developing um, model bylaws. There's one from the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, one from Department of Energy Resources and one from the Cape Cod Commission for um, models for large scale solar. Part of the reason we didn't give you specific communities is because, as Chris noted, some are more restrictive, some are less restrictive, and that has to do with the community themselves. So we didn't personally, we as staff were sort of talking this through and feeling like it doesn't necessarily make sense to give you a specific community's bylaw as an example because they're not Amherst. So these references that we gave you are just more in how you develop a solar bylaw and more generalized and the things to look for that are specific to our community that we're working with. So that's why we gave you these materials to begin with. I think maybe as you get further on, you might wanna look at other communities, but quite honestly, just, and this is my personal opinion, it might sort of confuse the, the issue to go to a specific community at this point in time, down the road maybe, but I would start with these we recommend that you start reviewing these materials that we've supplied to you first in developing our town's bylaw. Uh, one thing I do wanna share with you though, that's in the packet um, is that I um, worked on a um, solar permitting pathway flow chart. Oh, sorry, Janet, before I get into that, I'll, you had a question. More, more just a comment, because you can just get lost in this labyrinth of pages and pages of different bylaws from communities. And we do have 351 cities and towns in, in um, Massachusetts. You know, I looked at Athol, which is, um, you know, had a, they had, they did, I think it was UMass and, or Tufts did a um, community planning process with Athol, and they have sort of a model bylaw that sort of stops and asks questions. Athol itself was super con concerned with economic development and scenic views. They just felt like, you know, there were so many arrays going up. It was just going to be, you know, you're going to drive through Athol, which is a poor community, and just see solar arrays. And so they were concerned about where you could see things from and screening. Um, in the town of Palmer, they 
you know, protected their watershed and also they protected their industrial zones because they thought that was, they wanted businesses to go into the industrial zone that would be more employment than passive solar. So what was interesting to me, you know, like interesting to me, like everything legal is interesting to me in terms of bylaws, but it was, it was interesting to me to think about what did the community care about and how that was reflected in bylaws. And I almost think if a bunch of non-legal people were, um, you know, less deeply interested, it'd be interesting to see what different communities are making and the choices they've made. I think the most notorious one was some, I don't know if it's Waltham who basically said, nah, and limited it to like rooftops of houses and stuff. And that I think is the court case. Um, but it is interesting, like it'd be good for the committee and, and the town to be able, and members to be able to say, hey, here's the choices people are making. And it does come from a values perspective. And so that's it. Well, and I will add that, you know, you, the town council adopted a goal of carbon neutrality by 2050. That is absolutely something that in considering what the town prioritizes, that's a priority. The town council made that clear. So that is something you probably want to consider when you're, when you're looking at um, developing this uh, zoning bylaw. Laura? I know, I just build upon that. I think it's a great point. Um, you know, all the bylaws of different towns across Massachusetts and across the country are reflective of, of the town's priorities. Um, and to the extent possible, uh, you know, for us to be able to extract, whether it's the climate, you know, climate goals, carbon reduction goals, you know, boosting tax base goals, whatever that is for Amherst, um, you know, sort of getting to the heart of that. So this committee can also you know, look and see what priorities have been set by the town council uh, so we can uphold those. So I think that's a great idea because, you know, I think Athol, Palmer, um, their priorities might not be our priorities. So it wouldn't be wise to create a bylaw that mirrors another town that has a different, you know, value set than Amherst does. Thank you, Laura. Anyone else before I move on? I'm just looking at the time, so I'm trying to keep us on track as much as we can. Um, so I wanted to share this, um, this flow chart on the, on Groundmont Solar Permitting Pathway. Uh, bear with me one moment and I will share my screen. So um, very quickly, um, I will note that this permitting pathway um, you know, projects are very project specific, you know, so they don't come in as, you know, this is the one pathway that every project will take. So this is a generalized reference point for what typically happens. So when um, an applicant comes to the town and says, you know, I want to put solar in Amherst, and we're specifically talking about large scale ground mount solar here now. They'll first um, meet with the building commissioner and there may be, the building commissioner may then reach out to staff and say, well, there may be wetland issues. So we're gonna bring in the wetland administrator. Oh, there's a historic build, building on that site. So we're gonna bring in someone specifically from planning who you know, works with the historic commission. So um, depending on you know, what the project is, they will bring staff in. Um, they'll have an informal meeting and just sort of have a, a pre-application meeting is typically what we call this, where they just have a general discussion of like, this is what we're gonna do. So who are we gonna have to see? Which boards are we and committees are we gonna have to speak to? Um, what permits do we need? So um, there'll be a general discussion and then the application would then get submitted to the, the ZBA, the Zoning Board of Appeals or the Planning Board in some of these very specific cases, scenarios down here that are referenced um, and if the, if the application is complete, then it will go to the town clerk and the town clerk will then submit a legal ad and provide notica notification to abutters for the development of that project. Um, in the meantime, that application, while those things are happening, the application, the planning staff is going to then submit, and this is just a general course when we get applications, they go out to different staff members and rep and liaisons to various boards and committees. So there's kind of like a an email, you know, just sort of sent out along the network to various people that here's an application that's coming in. They may have relevance for you. 
either as staff or as someone who is a liaison to a committee that may want to look at it. So for instance, if it goes to the wetlands administrator, the first thing the wetland administrator is going to do is look at it and say, are there wetlands on site? And if there is, then that means that this is going to, this project is also going to have to go before the conservation commission. So the wetlands administrator will probably call the, you know, the applicant in to have a meeting. Um, they'll decide which form of um, permitting they should pursue if it's a request for determination, which is to determine whether it's okay as is or if it needs a more stringent review process, which would then be a notice of intent. So that will be submitted and then there'll be a public hearing process. Um, and the um, the application will then um, be reviewed for comments from the public. And there may be other outstanding issues that other agencies review, such as other endangered species habitat, or does this project exceed some kind of environmental threshold that's reviewed by the Mass Environmental Policy Act, also known as MEPA. Um, if that's the case, these two agencies will also have to review the application, and they would then submit their assessment and comments to the Conservation Commission. So when the Conservation Commission is making their decision, they have to weigh in these bodies' feedback as well in making their final decision. Um, and they can't make a final decision if these two agencies, which are state agencies, are triggered. They can't make a decision before these two agencies have weighed in. And they have to include any of their recommendations in their final order of conditions. So then these two agencies, which is why these arrows lead back to the Conservation Commission, they get weighed in. And then that determination is made or an order of conditions is issued, which is the permit. That decision then gets shared with the planning board as EBA, depending on who's reviewing the project at this point, at this stage. Also, if there are other, these are the other questions we may be asking. And again, this is not an exhaustive list. This is just sort of a typical, typical questions that are asked when a project comes in. Um, is the project on town land? Is it downtown or is it town sponsored project? Then the design review board is going to take a look at it. If it requires removal of a building or structure that's um, historic, then the historic commission is going to want to review and comment on it. And, um, and these bodies will also have a public meeting about this topic as well. Um, and then are there uh, stone walls that are along a scenic public roadway? Are there shade trees? Then it could be reviewed by the shade tree committee. They're also gonna weigh in um, uh, as well as the planning board will review that as well. And then all of these decisions all get fed into um, the planning board and ZBA process. So these things can happen simultaneously or they can happen consecutively. It all depends on how the applicant deals with it. It doesn't mean that the Conservation Commission will hear the project and, and the Zoning Board will make a decision without the, the Conservation Commission's input. They will review, if they know that the Conservation Commission is reviewing a project, they're going to want to know what the Conservation Commission's final determinations were. So the, the ZBA um, process is really where all of these all of these decisions from all these other boards and committees and all these other considerations have been reviewed taken into account and it feeds into their final decision so it helps guide their their decision their final decision that's issued um, and the planning board assists with that process the reason i am sharing this with you is that obviously what you are creating is something for ground mounted solar so this bylaw will be something that um, I believe the planning board will um, want to review and the ZBA will be reviewing as well and making their final decisions. And that's why the planning will be assisting with development of this bylaw um, because they're the committee that works most closely with the ZBA um, on regulatory issues. So I hope this is helpful. That was a very, I'm trying to do this as quickly as I can. Um, I'll stop sharing so that I can see you all in case somebody has a question about that. Okay, great. So as I said, it's it's not a particularly straightforward linear process. It depends on the project. Some projects 
may only go to two or three committees. Um, it depends on the project and where the siting is um, is is being proposed, and which is why creating a solar zoning bylaw will be useful and that priorities you know if there are priorities areas that are identified those may trigger other committees review and weighing in if that makes sense i hope that's clear okay so moving on now we're moving to the fun stuff <laughs> we get to elect a chair and a vice chair so um I'm going to lead this process of electing the chair and the vice chair. And once the chair is elected, the rest of the agenda, so identifying the agenda items for the next meeting and running the public comment will be on the elected chair. So um, my first question to you all would be who is interested? You can self-nominate yourself if you are interested in being chair or you can nominate another member. So I would ask if there are folks interested in chairing the committee or if someone wants to make a recommendation, please raise your hand virtually and I will call on you. Martha. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess um, I would be willing to be a chair in the sense that I'm retired. I'm not on any other committee, uh, at least any town committee and so on, so that I feel at least I, I do have some time uh, to devote to it. Um, I'm a generalist, as you probably heard, so I'm interested in, in sort of combining a knowledge from all the different specialties and trying to give our committee a sort of a basis of knowledge that we might all share on, on the various topics. But um, you know, I'm just one person here. Is there anyone else interested in self-nominating or nominating another member? Dwayne. Um, <clears throat> I feel like I don't know the members very well, so I, I'd be hard pressed to nominate anybody. Um, um, and, and that's, I feel badly about that. I just don't, we, um, uh, we just don't know each other that well, except for the short introductions. Uh, so I, I will, um, self-nominate myself um, to be chair or, or vice chair. I, I appreciate Martha's um, willingness for sure and, and retirement status, which offers <laughs> uh, more time than I have. I, I will say I, I would have some concerns about time availability, uh, but but um, I would say that um, solar and solar siting is, is something I do with my, my day job um, at the university uh, and, and with the uh, ECAC committee. Uh, for the town, uh, so um, these are issues that I'm I'm pretty qu quite familiar with and interested. I did spend time, as some of you know, at the uh, Department of Ener uh, the State Department of Energy Resources on on um, leading the renewable energy group there as well. So I'm familiar with sort of state context of all this as as well. Um, um, I, I'm not a zoning expert. Uh, but uh, 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 but I am uh, very involved with solar and land use issues um, as well as climate goals of the Commonwealth and of the town. And Laura. Well, I'll just say, so obviously not knowing you all, I did a bunch of research on everyone who's on the committee beforehand. Um, and I was actually going to nominate Dwayne, but I'm happy you nominated yourself because I didn't want to throw you under the bus there. So that's my opinion. I appreciate the nomination just because I'm uh, typically uh, don't, don't uh, flaunt myself very much. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm appreciate that. Yeah, I just think with your with the background that you have, um, especially because you worked at, at sort of, uh, you know, sort of the institutional level as well, it would be valuable, so. Martha, were you raising your hand again or putting your hand no, down? No, I was putting it down or trying okay. to. Okay, yes. all right, Janet. I wonder if we would consider co-chairs given um, the interest and time and experience, if that would be work workable to people. Um, I, you know, for me, the chair needs to be super organized, keep people on task, get, get meetings together um, and have time to do all that as well. You know, but obviously having the background in the area is super important too. So I wonder if we might consider that. Paul? 
Yeah. So having experienced co-chairs and I would really encourage you not to do co-chairs. It just creates a lot of communication issues and for staff, but also between the co-chairs. So I think it's much better to have a chair and a vice chair. Um, you can choose what you want as a committee, obviously, but in terms of an, a committee of this import, I think you would um, be best served by having a chair and you can change that out. Someone can do it for a while and then change out if you choose. Um, so that, that's just my, that's my advice. So um, Paul, just procedurally, and I'm sorry, because um, I'm not sure that the way we've been doing this is totally correct. So I just want to double check and verify with you. Um, do we take these two candidates one at a time and ask for a second and then do a vote for each? No, the way you would do it or is, um, I think the way you would say, if there are any other people who would like to nominate themselves or nominate someone else, and then you would declare the nominations closed, and then you would sort of go through procedurally through the uh, membership list and they would say who they would like to have as the chair and you'd you know you'd do that alphabetically or however you want to organize it okay and then and then the chair would take over the reins and then they would um, hold an election for a vice chair correct got it okay great thank you for the reminder um so i guess the nominations unless i hear from anyone else of their interest or their interest in nominating someone else Okay, then the nominations are closed. And um, I'm going to do it by the order that you pop up on my screen. It's not alphabetical. I hope that's okay. <laughs> but I will, um, I will ask you to unmute yourself. And I will ask you to identify who you are voting for. So for chair, we have Martha Hanner and Dwayne Brecker. Hmm. So I will start with Hanner. And you just unmute yourself, uh, Martha, and let me know. I'm, I'm and let us know who you're voting for. A little bit of a tough decision here, I must admit. <laughs> <laughs> because I mean, um, well, I guess since I nominated myself, I guess I'll vote for myself. But that doesn't mean I'm, uh, you know, jumping up and down there. Right. Uh, Corcoran? Uh, Dwayne Breger. Brooks? Uh, Martha, based on availability, and I have to go pretty soon, Stephanie, I have child care responsibilities. Okay. And Jemsek? Uh, yeah, I would uh, be comfortable with uh, Dwayne as a chair and, and Martha as vice chair. Well, we're going with um, chair for right now, so we'll hold the nominations for vice chair later. Breger? Yeah, well, I'll vote for myself then. Thank you. Pagliarulo? Uh, Dwayne Breger. And McGowan? Um, I, I feel like I don't really know who to vote for since I hardly know anybody. So I, I just am sort of in a dilemma. Like I'm leaning towards Martha for time and um, but also I have nothing against Dwayne. So I think I might just abstain because I have really no idea or basis to make a decision on, which is not my happy spot, so. Okay, so you're abstaining. Okay, uh, so we have four votes for Breger and two votes for Hannah and one abstention. So Breger gets the nomination and vote. So Dwayne, you are the new chair. <laughs> Yikes. So now okay. <laughs> we are handing over the election for the vice chair to you. So same process, please ask people whether they want to self-nominate or nominate another member. And then um, I can do the roll call vote for you. Great. Okay. Thank you. And for, and first thank let me thank everybody for their um, vote and, and uh, um, ability to chair this group and, and, and work together and look forward to it and, and look to um, everybody to contribute actively to this to this uh, to the work in front of us. Uh, I'll, my role will be to try to keep us organized. Um, okay, so the uh, the floor is open for nominations, either uh, self nominations or nominations of others for the role of vice chair. Jack. Yes, uh, I'd nominate uh, Martha uh, for vice chair. Okay. I second, that 
I second that nomination. Any other nominations, uh, including self nominations? All right. Uh, the, the nomination for vice chair is closed. Um, Stephanie, you want to lead a vote? Sure. So it's Martha. And Martha, you accept that nomination for yes. vice chair? I'd be happy okay. to. Okay. So Hannah? Yes. Corcoran? Hannah. Brooks? Yes. Jemsek? Uh, yes. Gregor? Uh, yes, Hannah. Pagliarulo? Hannah. McGowan? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay, great. Congratulations, Dwayne and Martha. Thank you so much. Thank, well, thank you. you. And Dwayne, thank I'd be, I've, thank you. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to working with you. I, uh, you know, we have different backgrounds, which I think will be good, fun, actually. And, yeah, I, I love uh, planetary science. <laughs> 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 um, great. Right. I look forward to it. And, and just to be yeah. clear, uh, when, if, if um, Stephanie, if, and, uh, if Martha and I obviously speak mm -hmm. offline, that's, we're not a quorum, right? Uh, that's the expectation is that we can organize ourselves offline. If it's housekeeping items, yeah. you can't be deliberating about anything. If it's exactly. just like, you know, who's going to cover what topic when we have the next agenda, those types of things you yep. can discuss offline. And if you want to include me um, and, and or Chris, just to sort of keep you um, straight about some of that, if we think you're crossing a line, we might say you can't have this conversation. So, you know, that would be helpful to include us. Um, and then, I, so the next agenda item is um, the agenda items for the next meeting. Dwayne, so. Okay, uh, well, um, I guess just another housekeeping, um, Stephanie, you, I, I believe, will be sending out a doodle poll to schedule the next meeting. Correct. Um, well, maybe... for the next meeting, we'll probably have to, we'll have to decide now. Okay. Um, okay. The doodle poll will be for the sort of ongoing regular meetings. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So um, uh, maybe we will first talk about agenda items, and then we will hone in on a time to meet um, for the next meeting. Uh, so um, what's the process, Stephanie? Am I opening up the floor for agenda items uh, for next meeting? Um, you you may. Yep. Um, I, um, yep. I will say, I, um, just, you know, as you said, um, the scheduling next meetings will be sort of one of the priorities. Um, obviously you'll review minutes, um, but you may want to, um, discuss uh, sort of having a first crack at some of those, um, the documentation that was shared with you. Mm -hmm. On the model by, bylaws particularly, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, um, I guess also in terms of, of housekeeping, we probably wanna um, review how we're gonna be taking minutes um, uh, for the meetings. Yeah. Um, and, um, and, and then yes, I, I I, I also wonder if it would be appropriate to spend a little bit more time, maybe three to four minutes each to just introduce ourselves a little bit more uh, to each other, uh, what our, yeah. what we bring to, what we feel like we bring to the uh, working group um, with regard to our, our uh, perspectives and expertise um, in, in this area. Um, I wouldn't mind an agenda item, and I, it may be a, a something for Chris to to uh, to uh, bring forward. Is just a um, or, or maybe somebody on the committee has this expertise, but a, sort of just a zoning one hundred and one. Um, what what is um, you know what what's the purpose of zoning? Um, what's the legal ramifications around zoning? Who's the audience for zoning? Um, how does zoning fit into that? Um, uh, solar um, um, decision making uh, uh, that you just shared, Stephanie, uh, in terms of that um, that uh, 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 chart that you you just uh, described of how, how solar uh, how the solar bylaws will specifically fit into that uh, process. Um, I, I I would suggest um, maybe having having that as an agenda item, um, and then. Um, um, I think we do have, I looked at them last night. I, I think we have, have three good 
um, model bylaws to look at. Um, I, it certainly helped me to get a sense of the scope of what's in these bylaws in, in the um, PVPC, uh, the DOER and the uh, Cape Cod Commission model bylaws that Stephanie uh, provided. So uh, maybe there's not a, an agenda item to um, have somebody lead us through uh, sort of the main components of that and, and uh, have a discussion about those components um, and sort of where um, our group might uh, particularly uh, choose to focus. Obviously, we need to cover the, the gamut of the bylaws of the bylaw, but uh, maybe hone in on, on some of the key issues that we think are, are, are particularly important for, uh, for this committee. Um, um, beyond that, I'd, I'd open it up uh, to um, other thoughts for agenda items. And I see um, Martha and then Janet. Yes, well, I really like the idea of a zoning 101. That's, that, I think that's, that's important for somebody like me. And I was thinking then maybe we could kind of uh, spend a few minutes just making maybe a wish list of what each of us thinks would be uh, something they wish all of our committee members were knowledgeable about, you know, like, like, uh, uh, Don, you know, would, if he's a battery expert and knows all the ins and outs of lithium batteries, maybe, you know, we, he'd like to suggest that we could plan uh, a session on that, or, you know, we might want to just go around and, and, uh, you know, pick some key topics for, you know, future one-on-one discussions. That's all. Great, uh, Janet. Um, in terms of in terms of looking at um, bylaws, I would hope that we would look at the ethyl Tufts UEP um, bylaw. It's it it's it's really terrific because it explains the process that they went through to get where they were, and then they actually have like a draft bylaw and saying you could decide this, you could decide that, and so I think that's like of all the bylaws the most user friendly. Um, but I just thought it was excellent because it's like a case study and it's sort of the process I think we're going to go through. So can, I'd add you, uh, Sorry, can you just mention the name of that bylaw again that you were saying? It's put out by Tufts um, UEP, the environmental program. Okay. I think, and then um, it's from Athol. I can find the link. It's floating around somewhere in my files. But it was super easy to understand and kind of a roadmap to decisions to make. But um, I actually really think we need to hone in on and, and talk at some length about what we're supposed to do because my understanding of the charge seems to be a little different than um, Stephanie's or other people's and I just think you know I thought that we would be doing be much more involved in the solar assessment in terms of locations and priorities and then um, you know putting together a map of where solar should be and I'm getting all this basically from the charge itself so I think it's worth a discussion to be like what are we supposed to be doing and, and who does what? Because I think that clarity will be good for the committee and keep us focused. And it'll be good for the public and everybody to kind of keep you know, the lanes clear and things like that. So I really do have a very different understanding based on the language of the charge. And then I see some language in the charge that could create some confusion. So I think we should all be on the same page um, and start out on that. Great. Thank you, Janet. Yeah, um, I forget whether Laura or Jack was first. I think Laura had her hand up first. Nope, Jack. Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you, Laura. Um, <laughs> and Duane, congratulations uh, for taking on the the, uh, the chair role. And uh, I just I think we shouldn't lose sight of you know who has the most experience with writing bylaws and and whose whose team that is, and that's Chris's team. And I think we need to put a lot of trust in her and coming, you know, up with, uh, you know, the drafts. And she certainly will, you know, I've been with the, on the planning board with her for six years and she takes in all our comments uh, and, you know, and it comes back at us. But I think, uh, I'm not sure that Chris's role uh, has been uh, highlighted to the extent that should be on this, or maybe I'm mistaken, but, <laughs> um, you know, I, I wanted to say that much because you know I, I'm looking at us and and nobody has written a bylaw in this group. I think if anybody has, they can raise their hand. No, all right. So just want to make that clear. 
We'll I can hey, come quickly on. <laughs> speak to that on behalf of Chris is that Chris is absolutely the expert here and um, that's why Chris and I are your staff liaisons and there's different pieces I was just sort of helping today and facilitating to sort of get us going but Chris is going to be very much key and instrumental in helping you through developing the zoning bylaw and her team so I'm I'm sort of a nuts and bolts for the most part you know when the when you start really working on the zoning bylaw I'll be bringing in, you know, with along with Dwayne some ECAC comments, but, um, you know, I'll be helping sort of facilitate engagement with the community and other pieces. So Chris will be definitely your reference point for development of the bylaw language. Great. Thanks, Jack. Anything else? Great. I, I did see Janet's hand go up a little bit. I think she has some experience with uh, writing uh, things that, uh, at least similar to, to uh, bylaws and maybe solar bylaws and uh, appreciate her um, expertise uh, to sort of work with, uh, work uh, provide that expertise to the group. Um, and um, uh, so let me go to Laura. Yeah, I wanted to just, uh, I think Jackie made a really great comment there with Chris's expertise, but I wanted to just raise a little bit of concern um, and I think it's really good to look at, just for reference, the bylaws of the other towns. But I think that, you know, again, reiterating the priorities of Alcohol are quite different than the priorities of Amherst. So while their main concern might have been, you know, sort of the, the visual impact, you know, to my knowledge, Alcohol doesn't have strong climate goals. Um, so, I, you know, to the extent that we're looking at other communities, you know, you know, if Tufts worked with Athol and developed this roadmap, it was based on Athol's priorities as a town. Um, so I just want to make sure that we actually clearly know our town's priorities before we develop our own roadmap. So that's my comment. And I, 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 I'm not sure if it's premature, but I do wonder whether there's a conversation to be had, maybe at a very pretty general level at the next meeting or a meeting uh, soon of what the priorities are um you know i don't and i and and how how do we how do we come up with priorities for the town obviously we're we're uh six constituents uh member constituents within the town i don't we don't speak for the town priorities but i think um uh to some extent if we at least maybe think about how to categorize um, the different the priorities within the town. I think we can each. Obviously, we have some priorities from the committee I represent. ECAC planning uh, planning probably has some pr priorities uh, with regard to their thinking about the town, um, and 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 obviously the the public as well. Uh, but I think uh, maybe some conversation and agenda item at least to get a conversation started and structured about you know how do we how do we when we start thinking about the solar bylaws how do we how do we think about the different priorities that the town has that need to be accommodated? Actually, just one further follow-up question. Um, my understanding of this group, and this would be good to clarify, is bylaws aren't necessarily defining where we want solar to go. It's all of the criteria to look at, you know, setbacks, things like that. You know, um, when you're developing a solar project, there are far more, you know, there's like base level considerations that, you know, if we said, okay, we want, we think solar should go here in Amherst, maybe a landfill or whatever. If you are a solar developer, one of the first things you're gonna look at is, what's the interconnection to the grid? How long is it? How much is that gonna be? And even if the town of Amherst said, this is a great location, it might not stand up economically. So my, I think some clarity there, and I think this is to Janet's point, Janet's point too, you know, I, I didn't think we were gonna be establishing where solar is going to go, just sort of what we're looking at across the board and what we require, whether it's, you know, proximity to wetlands or, you know, obviously distance from wetlands, um, different setbacks, you know, things like that. So that would be helpful for me. Great, uh, Jack. Yeah, I know. I know we all want to move on. It's what we're two hours in, but I just want to mention that we'll probably be pointing back, and Chris would guide us on this in terms of the master plan for the town, which is uh, quite a good one, vetted, uh, has everything soup to nuts, and there's you know conflicting objectives. I guess uh, 
in that, and that's for us to kind of sort out. Um, but you know, I think that that's a good starting place. I'm sure that Chris will, you know, be steering us toward that uh, uh, for for our initial sort of uh, sights on the objectives. Great. Um, let me note noting the time that we're at time. Uh, let me uh, take the priority to to move to to the um, next topic that we need to resolve before we all leave, uh, which is our next meeting. Um, <laughs> my suggestion is we 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 um, meet again in about two weeks um, uh, to keep our momentum going and and uh, and so forth. Um, uh, obviously it's summertime vacation time, but how do people feel about trying to meet in, 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 in two, in, in two more weeks? That's the week of July 4th. Do you want well, to yeah, well, we'll make a, that, that week? <laughs> the following week is the week of July 11th. Do you want to propose a time, you know, I know Wednesdays at this time obviously don't work, but um, just for the next meeting. So this isn't ongoing. This is just for the next meeting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Martha, did you have? Um... I'm afraid I'll be away until the fifth, the fifteenth, uh, okay. which is the Friday the fifteenth. But be on the west coast on an island. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, well, we just need to have a quorum. Yeah. Anybody else uh, not available? the week of the uh, just categorically not available the week of the 11th I might I do hate to schedule it then without the vice chair but um is Martha available that Friday the 15th yeah if if the airlines cooperate I'll be getting back home about probably 2 30 a.m on the 15th so I'd be available late in the day 2 30 a.m <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, so I probably wouldn't want a 7 a.m. meeting, but uh, nor, nor would I. <laughs> I, could, I, could, I could, you know, come to later in the day if you wanted. OK, uh, um, yeah. then, you know, I don't want to push it too late on a Friday yeah. afternoon, but how, yes, how, but, would, would uh, Friday at noon? Yeah, yeah, Friday the 15th at noon. Yeah, I, I could I could do that if United yeah. Airlines is willing. Um, yeah. Any objections to that? Or, or Stephanie and, and Chris, are you available then? I'm pretty sure I'm available. Yeah. Great. Do we need to take a vote on that or can we just decide? I, I think you can just say yeah, that's your next meeting. <laughs> okay. Let's, uh, let's then uh, plan to meet again. Uh, and S Stephanie, I'll work with you on the agenda and, the, and then the public notice and so forth. But for Friday, July 15th, noon to... 130 is that the normal uh, two, i know i think we give two hours two, two. okay so two noon, noon noon to two and then we have public comment yes and we do I, have I'll, members of the public yeah i'll get to that in a moment yeah. uh, but Laura that, was first. My, that was my question nope that's great i just didn't want people to bail <laughs> yep okay Laura, did you have a, a comment no my question was just about the public who's been okay who's been great listening okay uh, with that, um, let's turn to our last agenda item before adjourning, which is uh, availability for any of the, our public participants who wish to make provide a comment. Uh, the floor is open. Um, I think Stephanie or Chris, do you? Um... If, if they raise their hand, I can allow them to okay. speak. So if you could electronically raise your hand if you would like to speak or make a comment or have a question. Okay, Laura McLeod. Laura, you're unmuted. Thank you, Stephanie. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Well, congratulations again to the, this important working uh, group. I think it's essential for the town. Uh, we are being pressured by all fronts from climate situations and our town is going green definitely uh, i'm very happy for that i am one of the supporters and i translated and interpreted the the car project I'm very happy with that and, and and since stephanie is sharing we share so many other events and with this and and martha janet so 
And thank you, Paul, too. I don't know the, the, the other members, but uh, thank you very much for doing this project and all my best for you to look at the protection of forests. I am a strong, long time environmentalist since the 80s, founded groups. I, every time I do my translation work, my education work in my different board groups, I, I connect all possibilities to protect the planet. We only have one, there is no planet B, and every community, every decision maker and policy maker can do a lot. There are bylaws, there are other towns doing a lot ahead of us, locally, nationally, and globally. So you should be able to look at all those and get the best out of it. That's why you are there for, that's why you are public servers. So thank you very much. And uh, I, I'm very happy that the town is going forward. Thank you, Paul, uh, and uh, uh, all the best. Huh? Uh, the time is tickling. There is no time. There are, check the United Nations goals for the, the sustainable development goals that were asserted, and we are on a, on a climate crisis. I, I don't need to say more, but uh, as an environmentalist for, with more than 40 years, uh, the, it's, uh, I'm bleeding. The planet is bleeding badly in every aspect. And you can do things, more things to save the forests. Mm? Uh, solar should go on, we know where they should go. And uh, uh, I know this is a ground, ground level solar, but you must be careful where you choose to go for solar. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. All the best. I cannot attend other meetings, but I will do my best. Thank you, Dwayne, very much. Mm -hmm. Martha, and all my best for you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Laura. Good comment. Any other comments from the public? Now's the chance to raise your hand. Great. Seeing, seeing none, at least on my screen, Stephanie. Um, no yep. one. Um, any uh, any final comments before we adjourn? Great. Okay. So uh, again, thank you for your vote of confidence to chair, um, and look forward to to uh, our year together uh, and uh, and our next meeting on July fifteenth. Um, and um, I guess I officially declare this uh, committee adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Duane. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Well, 